All right, I would like to welcome all for, to jo for joining us for the new leader orientation session. Yes, and I would like to remind everyone if they could just mute their Zoom so that we can hear each other. Um, that would be that would be great. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Susan Smith and I work for Mercy Education um, in board leadership. And tonight we're so honored to have Sister Pat Coward with us to speak about board practices and governance. And Sister Pat comes to us, wow, with quite a, a background and experiences that she will share with us. So Sister Pat earned her undergraduate degree in physical education and health from Salisbury State College in Maryland and a master's degree in school administration from the University of Dayton. She served as an educator in Mercy Schools in Mobile, Alabama, Baltimore, Maryland, Macon, Georgia, and Savannah, Georgia. She served as the assistant principal at St. Vincent's Academy in Savannah from 91 to 2012. Sister Pat served on the board of the Mercy Secondary Education Association and the Mercy Education Network Board. She recently completed nine years in leadership on the South Central Leadership Team. Sister Pat was a part of the leadership committee responsible for the project of creating Mercy Education. She is currently serving as an Institute Minister for the Sisters of Mercy. Sister Pat, thank you again for joining us this evening and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, so I have to begin with a disclaimer, I think on some of this, and that is that um, when Kim Baxter contacted me last year, uh, I had, was a newly appointed Institute Minister and had absolutely no clue what my schedule was gonna be like. Um, and so I hesitated. And I hesitated for another reason. I hesitated because I thought, what can I offer on this very, I don't know, kind of detailed topic? I was like, oh no, I, I'm much better at other things, you know? I thought, oh. So I, she said, well, I'll just think about it. So we thought about it together. And then I realized how in the world could I ever say no to anything that Mercy Education asked me to do? Um, uh, so we have reshaped this presentation a little, a little bit. We've tweaked it, and I'll get into that in a minute. I can't say no to Mercy Education. I'm Mercy Educated through and through. I think my slideshow starts now. So that was my image to say, and prompted by Mary Beth Lennon. I'm a Mercy High alum, Baltimore, Maryland. My heart belongs to Mercy Education. It always has. It always will. And the cute little stonework there is actually a replica of St. Vincent's Academy, um, which is the oldest Catholic high school in the country in continuous operation in its original building. So it's a Sisters of Mercy Foundation. Um, I trust that you have experienced or will experience your board formation that educates you in the structures as well as roles and responsibilities necessary for board service. It is critical that both the board chair and the head of the school be well-versed in these roles. And I think it's equally important to develop a solid understanding of board governance and what I would call right relationship. So that's what we're gonna do. My hope for this time together is to reflect and explore together what I believe are key concepts for right relationship between the board chair and the head of ministry. Keeping in mind that governance is a way of expressing relationships that stands over time. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, back one. We want to emphasize that governance is, while we're talking about relationship, don't lose sight of governance because that's a way of expressing relationships that stands over time. So before we begin, I'd like to take some time for prayer. We find ourselves in this moment in history, in this world in which we live, more than ever in need of healing and stability. 
I offer to you this song as reflection. It is sung in Hebrew and English. It represents our Judaic Christian roots. It speaks to all faiths, all people. And the performers are young men and women, so very much like the ones we serve in our schools. We advance to the next slide. amazing isn't it um this is the service we're called to we think of ourselves as educators but at every day we're healers and our young people are crying out for this we hold an awesome responsibility in leadership in schools we always have and it feels like even more so these days 
I've identified what I think are some key concepts for this discussion and for reflection. Of course, I'm sure you'll add to this list. And in fact, I hope you will as you continue to pursue this topic with your board members. So let's start with the relationship between the sponsor, the Sisters of Mercy, and the school. And I selected a quote from the Constitutions of the Sisters of Mercy. And this is a document that guides <clears throat> the community members, uh, but it's our life and our mission. So it's always those with whom we work. As Sisters of Mercy, we sponsor institutions to address our enduring concerns and to witness to Christ's mission. Within these institutions, we, together with our coworkers and those we serve, endeavor to model mercy and justice and to promote systemic change according to these ideals. Our constitutions go on to say that by collaborating with others in works of mercy, we continually learn from them how to be more merciful. So a few words about sponsorship. It is a formal relationship between a recognized Catholic organization, the Sisters of Mercy in this case, and a legally formed entity, the school. It is entered into for the sake of promoting and sustaining the church's mission in the world. When I first came into leadership in 2012, we were engaged in the process of bylaws revisions for our sponsored schools, among other ministries. In the process of doing this work and the discussions around the term, excuse me, sponsorship and the Sisters of Mercy, it was very clear to me, and I think to our team, that it really is about relationship. It's not about whatever financial support may or may not be available. It is about the relationship between the sponsor, the Sisters of Mercy, and the school. The terms sponsor and sponsorship, while lacking a formal theological basis, do connotate a responsibility of trust, of attending to something sacred. If you're not familiar with this picture on the left, the infamous door to the original House of Mercy, which is where Catherine McCauley founded the Sisters of Mercy. Catherine extends her hand in welcome and have highlighted the enlarged hand because into your hands has been placed a sacred trust to carry forward the legacy and vision of mercy in the field of education. What does this sacred trust mean for the board and the head of the school? <clears throat> for one thing, it calls you to learn and hold the essential elements that make these schools mercy. As Sister Helen Marie Burns stated in her remarks to the Mercy Secondary Education Conference, in 1985, you who join with the Sisters of Mercy in this labor of love would be well advised to learn something of our history and our spirit, for it is, they are, affecting your life. <clears throat> Helen went on to say, just a few thoughts from that same presentation. Consistent in the tradition of mercy service is a call for excellence a call for the best quality of service rendered. The call rests, I think, in the profound reverence for persons. Relative to the profession of education, excuse me, yes, profession of education, Catherine offers two very practical reasons for this call to excellence. And I quote from Catherine McCauley, to teach while kindness and patience, though indispensable, will not suffice without a solid foundation of a good education and a judicious method of imparting knowledge. She goes on to say, if we in Catholic schools are not efficient teachers, our schools must degenerate. Our scholars will seek education somewhere else. I offer a resource to you that's a book called <clears throat> With Fidelity, and it's a collection of keynote addresses from 18 years of Mercy-sponsored education conferences for those of you who are younger, this is an old book. I realize that, but it's timeless. I mean, there are some of what I call the great women of mercy 
who gave presentations to that conference year after year after year. <clears throat> I raised the book up for you based on the words that I read in the forward. We dedicate this book to those mercy educators who will come after us, that it may assist them when they thirst for spiritual inspiration, that it may provide them with a touchstone to the history and charism of mercy education, which circles us right back to Helen Marie's call. You would be well advised to learn something of our history and our spirit and reading things that are of inspirational level rather than necessarily academic studies is certainly a great boost to the heart. This sacred trust is also a call to you to leadership. In the spirit of mercy, you are called upon. Susan, you have to hit a click to animate this. There you go. In the spirit of mercy, you are called upon to see that this ministry can be identified within the mission of the Catholic Church. You are called to see that this ministry as a sponsored work of the Sisters of Mercy is faithful to the charism, mission, core values, and tradition of the Sisters of Mercy. You are called <clears throat> to see that this ministry is rooted in the teachings of Jesus Christ in the tradition of Catherine Macaulay. This is what we mean when we talk about gospel values, about value-centered education. Sponsorship calls for an understanding of the governance structures by those involved. So here's a graph of structures. <laughs> I bet all of you are very familiar with, so let me just hit the highlights here. The board of directors is incorporated as a two-tier board with the Sisters of Mercy being the corporate member. Now, in the case of the schools, the canonical sponsor, the Sisters of Mercy, has delegated their authority to MESA, meaning that MESA is the corporate member. The corporate member is responsible for the Catholic identity. That's what we call the public juridic person. They maintain some reserve powers. Among these is the appointment of persons to the board of directors, and the approval of the appointment of the head of the school, whether that be a principal or president. The primary responsibility of the board is to steward the mission and resources of the school by exercising the powers delegated from the corporate member. The board as volunteers offer their skills and expertise as people interested and invested in the mission. Now, governing boards do have legal obligations and they are responsible for making very important decisions about how the school will operate. But they are not responsible for operations in a day-to-day -day sense. The board actually delegates by virtue of hiring the head of the school those day-to-day -day operations and management of the school. The board is responsible for setting up policies about how things are run, for creating a budget. By creating a budget, the board sets priorities that are consistent with the mission and the ministry. By creating a strategic plan, the board attends to the question of the sustainability of the ministry as well as the responsible use of the resources. The board represents the school, the organization to the community. They maintain the public trust. The head of school is responsible for operations and personnel within the school. Yeah. And the head of the school is accountable to the board of directors. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about relationship. I believe it's essential that the board chair, the other board members, <clears throat> excuse me, the head of school interact with mutual respect, integrity, and open, effective communication. They need to be able to engage in robust conversations that are honest, candid, 
and respectful. Using these very basic principles of board governance, let's explore how all of this plays out using the pandemic as a case study. In March of 2020, schools found themselves facing county, city, or state mandates where schools and even churches were no exception to the directives to shelter in place. Decisions were needed then. And decisions continue to be needed regarding in-person learning. So where is the intersection for decision-making and communication for boards and school leaders? Keep in mind, the management of day-to-day -day operations is the responsibility of the head of the school. And the board is accountable for oversight of the organization. So what was it like for you as you worked on decisions and communications for the future operations of your school during the pandemic? Who was at the table? What decisions were needed? What potential impacts of decisions were explored? I want you to reflect on the relationship between the board and the head of the school as decisions were being made and these decisions were communicated. Did the process reflect mutual respect, integrity, and open, effective communication? You see where we're going with this is about this relationship between all these roles and responsibilities that everybody shares. How do are we a whole community in leading? So at this time, uh, it's time to <clears throat> collaborate with one another in mercy and learn from each other. Uh, going to, uh, I think Kim is gonna be the work the magic on this one and send people into small groups. Welcome back to our regularly scheduled program. I hope you enjoyed your <laughs> break. <laughs> uh, all kidding aside, um, looks like all this is working now. Um, you had the questions in the chat. The focus for me here, and, and I'd like you to share, first of all, share whatever you want to share from your group. Always that permission. If you need a focus, if you say, oh my God, I don't know where to begin. I, I would like to hear about the communication, the give and take between these two roles of leadership. You know, um, during our time in a small group, Sister Regina Ward said to me, are you suggesting that the board would be involved in the operations of the school? And I said, no, but they have oversight, so they ought to know what's going on. Um, so in the pandemic was something we couldn't prepare for. I mean, I think science thought they knew, but we didn't know. And all of a sudden, there we were making, no, there you were. <laughs> I had a different world. There you were. What are we going to do with these kids? What is our, what is, what do we owe them? And how are we going to do this the best possible way? And you're the leaders, your school leaders and your board leaders. What was it like? That was your basically your question. So could we hear from some different groups now? Are you familiar with using the reactions button to raise your hand? Or I acquiesce to our facilitators for this meeting. If you think the group is small enough, you can just spot people. I've I still only see one page. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah, so you can have. use you can use the like old fashioned wave your hand to get our attention. <laughs> or you can just start talking whenever you're ready. Uh, well, I I'll go. Okay, Mary Lee. And okay. tell us where you're from, Mary Lee. So I am the newly appointed board chair at Mercy High School in Baltimore, uh, taking over that position this summer. Uh, but prior to being um, board member, I, or I, prior, prior to being board chair, I was a board member and I co-chaired the COVID response team with Mary Beth Lennon and our Dean of Students at that time. And um, so we were talking in our 
group, uh, our small breakout session about how um, we established a series of committees uh, around certain key areas um, around academics, uh, around you know the physical, um, all, many of the physical and um, safety issues that had to be handled, um, decisions that had to be made during the pandemic, uh, technology, for instance. And what we did was all those committees were um, had members of the of our board as well as members of the executive team. And so it was really, uh, I describe it as an all hands on deck approach where these committees were meeting on frequent basis to um, brainstorm ideas, do research, you know, um, to come back with ideas on how we were gonna tackle this long, very, very long list of things that had to be addressed, particularly between I would say, you know, March and September of 2020 getting getting us back, getting the school back in person, even in a hybrid, you know, format and figuring out what that was, what, what, what does that schedule look like? How many students are at home? How, who's in the building? Who's not? You know, there were just uh, countless things to decide. But I think um, having th that committee structure and so many people involved um, leaning on their strengths um, made it uh, a really, um, I mean, I think we, it was a successful experience, but it was also just really spread the burden around, you know, and and made it so that lots of information was getting gathered and shared up to um, the president and the dean of students and the board chair and the executive committee. Great, thank you, Mary Lee. Mm -hmm. Someone else? I was going to say that um, it's Jared Buckley, the board chair from Mercy High School in Farmington Hills, Michigan, and uh, our our principal uh, Pat Sattler was was part of our breakout group, and uh, we we talked about and and also uh, it, it was mentioned by Joe Haas that and and others about the uh, the politics involved, and I, I think Lindsay brought that up as well, that uh, we had mask wearing um, much. Uh, longer and and uh, than the other schools, especially the public schools, and and we you know came under some criticism for that. But I do think that the, that the girls kind of got used to it, and uh, but now as of February 28th in, in, in southeastern Michigan, there's not going to be any mask wearing. Um, and Pat was pointing out, and I think she's correct that the. Uh, Department of Health and the other agencies are just kind of tired of it all. They're, they're tired of the criticism and uh, okay, fine. You folks don't want masks, so we won't have masks. And, and I sure hope it all works out. And uh, because we do know that there's immunocompromised folks and uh, might put them in jeopardy, but it is what it is and, and hopefully it'll all work. And yeah, tough spot there in Michigan for sure. Others? Thanks, Jared. Uh, Carol. Yeah, Carol from uh, Louisville, Kentucky at Central High School. I'm really interested in what Mary Lee said and for a slight minute, I felt bad about myself uh, because we kind of took a different approach at Assumption. Um, last year, oh my God, we built a new extension to the building. We were doing uh, year, year one of our strategic plan. We were doing incredible fundraising as part of that strategic plan. Then the pandemic hit in the middle of that. Um, and I think as a board, what we made a decision to, now we knew where we stood with the computers already because we already had the computers and tablets in place for some years. So we knew we were ready to go hybrid. But we made the decision not, not to maybe add on more meetings than we already have related to the building, related to the capital campaign, uh, related to any number of things just out of, sheer worry of the exhaustion of, of the people with whom we were working. I would text regularly, Mary, do you need anything? Is there anything the board could do for you? Is there anything we need to be aware of? But then, uh, Pat, to your point, a huge level of trust in knowing her as I do, because I've been on the board three years before that, uh, came into place. And so was, I, I think it was one of those gut decisions we made uh, to stand ready to help, to hear the reports at the board meetings, to get some emails from her with stats about quarantines, infections, what are we doing with this? How are we doing with that? 
and then kind of to stay out of the way a little bit because just so much was going on already. The building had to be ready to launch this fall. <laughs> we had to have a new schedule developed for the students this fall, all during a pandemic. So uh, I kind of envy what they had uh, that Mary Lee's, but I don't know that it would have worked very well or it might not have adversely created a little bit of, oh my God, can you just give us a break? We're, we're dying here with everything else going on. So right call, I don't know, but it's the call we made. Uh, but I feel like we were, we were made aware of everything that was going on. And of course the archdiocese and the governor were deciding quite a bit of it. <laughs> we just had to read. Yeah, yeah, that's read what they were telling us was going to be happening tomorrow. Uh, we just went mask optional for the schools. We're just told by the archdiocese yesterday they can each go mask optional individually, which is a change for our archdiocese not to make it a sweeping thing. So again, different approach. I don't know. Well, you know, it's like that cartoon picture that shows the kids with their little spacesuits on and. Decisions had to be made, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and that cartoon also implicates, or indicates, I'm not sure it's the right word in this case, the parental role. So you got board, you got school, and you got parents. Mm -hmm. And you're navigating pretty turbulent waters at that point. Others, uh, we take a few more. If, I was just going to add on to that. I think I, I understand what you're saying about like feeling bad, maybe that you were doing something that another school, maybe their board was, but honestly, I, I think everybody would agree that everybody did. We all have our different communities, right? And we all know how each other work best and how we support each other. So I wouldn't feel badly about that, that you didn't do anything right. You offered support in the way that was needed. I know when we put our plan together, our board was there, like, what do you need? And they, you know, were very supportive. We chose a different approach than any of that, where we really um, were very much in, in um, employee voice. And so we wanted to be sure it was grassroots. And so we started our plan. We didn't have a lot of external. I know a lot of schools had a lot of external stakeholders come in. We thought it was important for our plan to be grassroots because it would be our teachers and staff that were living that. And so we did a lot of internal planning and buy-in and making sure that nobody felt like this was a top down. Um, you know, what can we live with? What can we do? This is what we're going to agree together in partnership. Um, but that was just what worked for our community. So I'm sure everybody here was successful and just did what their community needs were and just have a strong relationship with their board and their president, principal, whatever, and that leadership team to do what was right for them at the time. And even that keeps evolving. You know, I mean, I think, um, you know, where initially it was so internal now, you know, we may look more to our board for certain initiatives that we have that they support us because we need it for that specific problem. So it's that's good. Fluid. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Well, I I have a feeling that. Um, Looking around the room, some of you interact with each other professionally, uh, whether wherever you may be. Um, I know some of your schools, um, which always makes me feel good uh, after all those years in Mercy Education to say, oh yeah, oh yeah, there's Holly, there's Tadiks, you know, it's kind of fun. But you you create a network and you share with one another in ways that cannot be captured during this little bit of the Brady Bunch screen here. So um, I honor your time. I always want to honor your time because it's evening and I'd like to move us into the next piece, which requires a request, some reflection from you. Some, uh, it's a little more peaceful inner kind of reflection. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the time and it's very possible that we might uh, not go into small groups, but just take some silent reflection in our place and then invite you to share with one another um, in order to do the time. So Susan's going to um, move us to the next slide where we address the topic of stewardship. There you have it. 
So if you've ever sailed, and if you've ever had that particular job, which is to sit in the cockpit and control the head sail, um, it's very challenging. One of the very real challenges shared by the board and the head of school is beautifully expressed in some comments from Sister Helen Amos when she addressed Mercy Educators in 1983. Helen said this, the real challenge is energetic pursuit of the vision for which we are responsible. <clears throat> if governance is the structure that enables the sponsorship relationship to stand over time, what then will provide the energy to pursue the vision? You have things on hand to lean into. You have Mercy Formation Program. You have all the resources that Mesa supplies you. And these are for board, school leaders, and educators. And it's essential to participate in these kinds of programs. You have another place. You have an inner place where you uh, tap into the vision. And that is your own witness through your actions to the gospel and mercy values. These call us to respect for the full human dignity of each and every person. Here I'm going to turn our um, attention to a reflection process as we learn from one another what it is we need to pursue the vision. I love to sail. Yes, I, yes, that is me. And somebody asked me if I was about 10 when that picture was taken. I know actually I was about 50. Um, that's Mobile Bay. And that's a 30 foot Catalina. And that's a fun way to spend a day. I think sailing provides both a burst of energy as well as some peacefulness that comes with a day of sailing. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to use sailing as a metaphor to help us talk about our pursuit of the vision. <clears throat> Here we are today, shaped and formed by our history, our own experiences, the pandemic and the challenge of what lies ahead. You hold the responsibility to tend the vision, to embark on the journey. Now, when we travel by car, I was gonna say by plane, but it's not true because you have to go so many different ways to get someplace sometimes. When you travel by car, usually you can pretty much move in a straight line to your appointed destination from point A to point B. But when you sail, you often have to tap, traversing side to side in order to get from point A to B. And you can see that you actually make motion moving against the wind. And sometimes that's how our journey is with ministry. Guiding this journey are the values of Catholic teachings and the mercy, charism, and traditions. Guiding this work, this vision, is respect, collegiality, and collaborative relationships. So when is it that we're tacking? It's when we engage in active listening and questioning for clarity among the leaders. There's a give and take, a back and forth. That's tacking to get from point A to B. Let me go on with some more of these sailing images. The shrouds, I don't have a pointer to do this if I was in the room. So if you've sailed, the shrouds are heavy cables that support the mast. They run from the body of the boat to the top. And without the shrouds, the mast doesn't stay up. Without the mast, no sails. Without the sails, you get it now, right? No movement. Now tied to the shrouds, this heavy cable, are these little pieces of yarn that are called telltales. And they indicate the direction of the wind into the sail. Anybody can get telltales. You don't have to have fancy equipment to find out the direction of the wind. Surrounding the outer lines of the boat from cockpit to bow is another single line of cable that runs through a stanchion and that's called the lifeline. So these are pretty significant parts of a sailboat. The, the, uh, the shroud, the telltales, 
the lifeline, and then the movement of tacking. Here's a question for reflection. As we reflect on the meaning and purpose in this journey, this tending the vision, what new perspectives do we gain as we tack back and forth on our way? What are the telltales for us that fill our sails with the wind that is energy? What are the sturdy supports like the shrouds in our life? What and where are the lifelines in our experiences? Susan, let's leave that slide up. I'm gonna um, be flexible. If we've learned anything during pandemics, be innovative and flexible. Uh, so instead of going into small groups, I'm gonna leave this up in front of you and I'm going to ask you to take your own personal quiet time right now to see what one of those questions touches you as you think about stewarding this very precious mission of the Sisters of Mercy, Catholic education. Which of these images evoke something from you that you could just share with the group? And this is not a dissertation. This is not a fully developed idea. This is a moment, a snapshot whatever touches you to share with the whole group. I think we're a small enough group to do that. So I'm gonna, I'd like to take the, mm, three minutes, sit with the questions, see what calls to you, maybe scribble some little thoughts for yourself, and then we'll come back and see what kind of sharing and encouragement we can offer to one another as we tend the vision. So uh, electronic, raise your hand so your screen will pop up, your, your photo will pop up on the side now or on the side panel. Uh, Jenny, and tell us where so, you're from. Uh, I'm um, from Our Lady of Mercy Academy in Syosset, New York. I have uh, two, uh, another board member and our principal uh, at this meeting. And I think I could speak for them when I say that our girls, are what fill our sails with energy. And it's the admiration of the commitment and the charism of the Sisters of Mercy that are our supports, for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Zuli? Yes, so I'm tagging behind Jenny. I'm also from Our Lady of Mercy Academy. Um, I wanna touch on the new perspective what perspectives do we gain as we tack back and forth? Um, one of the things was to say, you know, to be fluid and flexible, it's more like being like Gumby. If any of you ever remember Gumby where you just had, it was a whole new meaning to flexible. And sometimes it was just being there for another teacher and just let the teacher vent and, you know, sometimes you just talk to another chair and it's like, hey, are you okay? And it was just, just listening. And even with the students, just listening to what they were going through and showing that someone was there listening was just enough. So that's something that, that um, helped on this journey um, because nobody ever planned for it. Great, great. Thank you, Zuli. Uh, Teresa, tell us where you're from. Hi, I'm from Walter Mercy Academy, which is in Marion, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, and what fills my sails that gives me the energy, I have an example from today. Wednesdays, we have community gathering at our school and um, we're in elementary school. And today for Black History Month, so Wednesdays through February, you know, we're celebrating our Black History Month and our Black families. Um, a graduate came in with her mother and they both shared how mercy is a part of their lives today oh, and wow. how they're spreading mercy throughout. Um, and it's looking at our students, looking at our graduates that just makes you believe that 
mercy is alive and well in our world. It's continuing through our students, uh, through our alum, and it's been a hell of a couple of years, as we all know. Yeah. But our kids keep going. Mercy keeps going, <laughs> you know? And, and I had that conversation today with another faculty member. They're like, she's like, how much more can I do? How much more can you do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't know, but we just keep doing it. And she said, it's because of Waldron. I love Waldron, oh. but I keep going. And I said, you know, that's just it. That's just it. it right there. So sorry for, you know, taking a little bit longer, but. It's okay. It's okay. Today was it's a all, good day. It's all good. Thanks, Teresa. Glad for you to share that. Hi, Denise. Do you want to tell us where you're from? So I'm from Mercy Macaulay High School in Cincinnati. Um, so I took the first question a little bit differently. And I think when I read the word perspective, I think the thing we've learned in this pandemic is that everybody has their own perspective mm -hmm. in this pandemic. And that it really, if you always keep the students in the forefront, mm -hmm. all the perspectives kind of fall to the wayside. And, and that's the perspective you always need to focus on. Um, and that's what ought to be guiding our way is the students and what the students need and what's best for the student ought to be guiding our way. That's great. Thank you, Denise. I have some more hands. Some of you have spoken, you can take your hand down and then that'll allow other people to We'll see theirs. If I think that's how this works. I sound so knowledgeable, really. <laughs> Sister Pat. Jared. Uh, I apologize. My, my laptop won't let me raise my hand. Oh, but, well, that's okay. I went I, to Jared. Go ahead. I, I wanted to just mention that. Uh, and, and I'm from um, uh, the uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees at Mercy High School in Farms and Hills, Michigan. I like to go to our open houses. And, and the energy I get is watching the, the students take prospective students around the school and the enthusiasm with which they do it, it's just unbelievable. And, and they together with the, the, the staff, the, the, the faculty, it's just an unbelievable experience just to be in that school. And uh, that's what brings me energy. Good, Jared, way to go to overcome technology and get in there, proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, you know, these, this is recorded not because of any great words I said, but because you can look at this slideshow again and you can hear each other again and something will come to you at another time. Remember at the beginning, I said, I listed four essential key elements and I hope you would add to that. Uh, you know, feel free to use whatever pieces of this would help you um, break open a discussion with your board in a way um, that's comfortable. You know, the sailing metaphors was my thing to use because that's fun. Everybody's got some fun thing that you can roll out. And all of a sudden, people are talking about things very close to their heart um, in ways that they might not if you said, tell me about what's close to your heart. So uh, I encourage you to be creative in ways that you can to engage the conversation. For many of you, um, I, you can leave that up, Susan. That's perfect. Um, for many of you, I'm pretty sure this was not the approach to the topic of board governance and best practices that you may have anticipated. I hope I didn't disappoint, but I also hope that it provided energy for you by collaborating with others in works of mercy. We continually learn from them how to be more merciful. And you've said it several times. It's about the students. That's the purpose of the opening song that I chose. It's, it's about these young people. It's, it's what we owe them it's, and what we challenge them to every day from kindergarten to the 12th grade. It's a preschool, some of you have, I'm sure, but we've been given a sacred trust in this world of education. While this might not have been what you anticipated, as we also have said, neither was March 2020. What we anticipated 
in any strategic plan being developed by any board or any school or any committee. We find ourselves challenged to be imaginative and innovative to what once seemed so straightforward. And we've been growing into that as Mercy educators for years now from where I stand. I wanna thank you for allowing me to have this time with you. And I wanna thank you for tending the vision of Mercy Education with your time and talent. And I wanna close with the prayer that is now on our screen. Now we all know how this Zoom thing works when we try to pray together. If you're muted, then everybody can see you moving your lips and we're praying together. If you unmute, we get blown away by all of the delays and now it's not prayerful. So I invite you to mute, to pray together in your own space and I will speak the words for our body. To be mercy is to be present, <clears throat> to listen, to show compassion, to understand, to care, to lend a hand, to love, to hope, to persevere, to share burdens, to grieve, to fight for justice, to bring peace, and always to have faith, live the gospel, and pray. May Our Lady of Mercy inspire each of us to continue our journey. Amen. Susan, do you wrap this up? I do. Okay, Susan, good. <laughs> <laughs> really, I really would just like to take the opportunity to thank you for um, sharing in such a creative way, such an important topic of collaboration and of working with heads and boards. Um, to say that, you know, I, I hate this word, but we keep hearing it unprecedented. The pandemic is so unprecedented. And what everyone has done to live through this and to work with our students is, is amazing. And I thank you, sister, for giving us that guidance and many more things to think about and how to uh, steer our ship or our boat for the next couple of months. So uh, thank you and thank you all for joining us on a uh, cold Wednesday night. And um, I hope everyone has a great night and thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you, Sister Pat. Oh, you're welcome. That's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to do this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.